Okay, so welcome to Thursday morning. I think we'll jump right in, and I'd like to introduce Jia Yu, who's going to introduce our uh, prize lecture for this morning. So. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, it's my greatest uh, pleasure to introduce my longtime uh, friend and also an outstanding um, scientist. Um, he got his uh, bachelor's from University of Science and Technology in China, his uh, PhD uh, from University of uh, Michigan, uh, Paul Hayes student. Um, he joined NCAR in 1997 with uh, Ray Robo as a postdoc. Um, and he le never left since then. He must uh, like uh, Rockies very much. Um, his work has special emphasis on the modeling uh, physical and the chemical processes on both global and local scales and the coupling between different regions of the atmosphere. Um, and he uh, works on the development of NCAR, time GCM, Wacom, and Wacom X models. Especially, he is leading um, the development of Wacom X. Um, he has a very productive uh, career with over 120 papers, with over uh, 3,000 citations. Um, just uh, give a few examples, um, his recent uh, important papers. Uh, graduate waves simulated by high resolution Wacom. Um, space weather review paper on the lower atmosphere forcing on the space uh, environment. Um, sudden stress warming effect on the ionosphere and the thermosphere. Um, large wind shears in the mesopause and tropopause. As a person, um, if you have ever worked with him, he never loses his smiles. Um, when he talks to you. Um, and he never says no to your questions or your collaboration request. He has mentored many um, uh, students, postdocs, and young scientists, including myself. Um, finally, um, just a trivia, he's a Chinese Tai Chi master. So even though he's super, super nice, but never uh, mess with him. <laughs> um, Without further ado, um, let me introduce, uh, give the time to Han Li Liu from High Altitude Observatory, NCAR. Thank you. Thank you, Zhao. Uh, thank you for the very kind introduction. And I'm stu uh, still a student on Tai Chi and still learning how to stand stably. And uh, um, if I can find my. Oh, the first one, right? Thanks. And also, I want to thank uh, uh, the uh, steering committee. This is uh, indeed a great honor, and um, and I I I uh, am humbled to have this chance to speak here. But still, something uh, the presentation not coming up. I thought I clicked that, right? Oh, here. Okay, good. All right. So, uh, and uh, so I think the work that's uh, got the award is the Wacom X, the uh, whole atmosphere uh, community climate uh, extended. And as you can see, this is a really a big team effort, and uh, I want to thank my colleagues. Um, uh, at HAO, ACOM, CGD, and uh, CISO at uh, uh, NCAR. And uh, um, I think uh, it is fair to say that this, is a, this award is really a recognition of this great team effort. And uh, uh, so this is the outline of my talk. Uh, first, I'm going to give some uh, historical uh, perspective on the Wacom X development. And then I'll describe uh, uh, the recent development and validation efforts and uh, uh, model capabilities for research. I'm going to show some highlights and uh, research examples uh, from uh, recent uh, investigations. And then uh, at the end, I'm going to provide some uh, uh, perspective on ongoing or future efforts of Wacom X development. 
So uh, I think uh, Wacom X development stems from the uh, uh, development of Time GCM, uh, which is the thermosphere, ionosphere, mesosphere, electrodynamics uh, general circulation model. And uh, that model has been developed by uh, Ray, Ray Robo and colleagues uh, since the 1970s. And, uh, and the whole community has participated in using the model and validate the model and push the model forward. And uh, my first uh, uh, CEDAR uh, workshop was in 1994, uh, which is a quarter century ago almost. Uh, and uh, at that workshop, um, uh, the price lecture uh, was uh, given by Dr. Ray Robo, and it was on um, the newly developed time GCM. And uh, this, is, uh, one, uh, this was one of the slides uh, Ray gave in his talk, and clearly laid out the development of uh, TGCM uh, from the thermosphere model, uh, adding the ionosphere and the electrodynamics, and uh, also the middle atmosphere. And uh, a few years later, as Josh said, I was uh, very lucky to join uh, HAO uh, as a postdoc working with Ray and other colleagues. And uh, my first uh, time GCM project was to uh, add this uh, gravity wave drag prioritization uh, in the model. And the purpose, of course, is to get the, uh, the primary purpose is to get the wind and temperature climatology uh, in the MLT region. And it uh, seems we were successful at that time. And, uh, uh, we get a very good wind reversal in the MLT region, and this is the, um, uh, from the Linsen scheme, we generate the gravity wave forcing uh, drag, and uh, using that, uh, Ray made the first uh, uh, time GCM uh, year-round run, uh, and this is the, cli uh, the uh, climatology of temperature uh, he showed, uh, and uh, here is the time for the year and the altitude, and uh, from the stratosphere all the way to the lower thermosphere. And uh, uh, you can see that, for example, the, the uh, 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 cold summer mesopause was pretty well reproduced uh, in the model. And the general temperature structure uh, is uh, quite consistent with our climatological understanding. And then uh, Ray said they, uh, he liked to use the model to look at more at the, uh, investigate the variability. Uh, in his words, he wanted to shake the model a little bit harder. Uh, so what he did was uh, he introduced the meteorological forcing uh, from NSEP. So he was forcing uh, time GCM at the lower boundary using the daily uh, NSEP reanalysis output. And indeed, you see a lot of uh, variability uh, just from doing that. And for example, uh, you see the stratosphere warming and the response in the uh, strong response in the mesosphere and lower thermosphere, and also uh, propagating planetary waves, uh, five to uh, seven day waves, for, for example, uh, in the uh, MLT region, very clearly uh, seen there. And we have done uh, quite some work analyzing the output. And uh, uh, the further development of Wacom, uh, sorry, uh, Time GCM, uh, uh, or at least one of the directions, was to improve the representation of the lower atmosphere. And uh, there are two aspects. One is to try to get the climatology right, and the other is to uh, study uh, or introduce and study the variability on climate and uh, weather scales. Uh, so on the, uh, clim uh, the climatology side, uh, of course, uh, very important to uh, have the tides, atmosphere tides, and this was specified using the global scale wave model developed by uh, Maura Higgin and colleagues. And uh, the, uh, also we uh, need to specify the gravity wave drag uh, 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 parameterization, and, uh, which I mentioned earlier. And uh, from on the climate and uh, uh, weather side, uh, the lower atmosphere is forced by uh, reanalysis uh, uh, from the uh, NSEP or ECMWF. And uh, uh, then uh, there's a need, we think there's a need for a more self-consistent uh, representation of the lower atmosphere uh, system. And uh, not just for uh, looking at the upward coupling, but also for downward coupling, uh, because this way you can uh, only study the uh, upward impact of the lower atmosphere forcing. So then uh, the first thing uh, Ray tried was to couple time GCM with the CCM3, which is a kind of uh, precursor or the previous version of the climate uh, model, the NCAR climate model. Uh, and then uh, there uh, we did uh, quite a few works using that coupled model. It's uh, very insightful uh, for studying the coupling. Uh, but also we noticed the problems, especially around the boundary. There are uh, discontinuities, for example. So 
Uh, so that's uh, one of the main motivation for a more, more integrated and uh, seamless model. And that motivates the development of uh, Wacom and Wacom X. Uh, the Wacom uh, development started in late 90s, and the Wacom X uh, started about 10 years ago, in 2008. And uh, these are the overarching kind of scientific goals or objectives of uh, Wacom and Wacom X. Uh, so uh, the we want to use the model to study the solar impact on the whole Earth's uh, atmosphere system, and uh, also try to use the model to try to understand and quantify the couplings uh, between atmosphere layers uh, through chemical, uh, physical, and dynamical processes. So this is very consistent with the mission uh, statement for uh, CDAR. And, uh, uh, and also, we want to understand the uh, meaning of this coupling for the climate and for the space environment. And the model is built upon the NCAR uh, Community Earth System Model, CSM uh, framework. So this is a block diagram uh, showing the structure of CSM. Uh, of course, uh, to study climate, you need the atmosphere component, but also you need the ocean, land, uh, sea ice, uh, land ice, and uh, biogeochemistry. Uh, and it's all coupled together with a coupler uh, uh, routine. And uh, this is uh, just in the physical space, how it looks like. Uh, so CAM is the kind of essential atmosphere component uh, in CESM. And, uh, but it has been developed to include chemistry, so there's the CAM-CAM, and extended to include the middle upper atmosphere or uh, up to the lower thermosphere, uh, that is the Wacom model, and then uh, all the way to the exosphere, and that is the Wacom X. And this is the uh, kind of the um, basic elements of the model uh, in the uh, table. And as I mentioned earlier, the model is built upon the model framework of a CESM. And uh, we have been mainly using this uh, dynamical core, the finite volume dynamical core. And uh, uh, though we are starting to uh, look at uh, the spectral element die core on a cube sphere, uh, because of its uh, ability of doing high resolution studies. <laughs> And then it has a, a chemistry, interactive chemistry module uh, with both uh, neutral and ion chemistry. And uh, uh, then the uh, many physics packages describing both the uh, neutral atmosphere, lower and upper atmosphere, and uh, the ionosphere. And uh, the, uh, the things in the green boxes highlights the uh, uh, development we have been doing in the last couple of years. Uh, one thing is that we need to modify the finite volume uh, dy dynamic core to accommodate uh, uh, thermosphere physics. I will discuss a bit more of uh, this later. And so that we can take into account the species de dependence of the uh, various uh, variables. And uh, then we need to uh, consider the metastable uh, O plus, which is important for the energetics. And uh, of course, we need to in uh, implement the ionosphere uh, package. Uh, here, uh, we have implemented the, uh, the um, uh, interactive ionosphere dynamo module, uh, the uh, ion electron transport, and also the ion electron energy equation uh, solver. So now I'm going to dig a little bit deeper in the model development. And uh, first, uh, we can review some of the important physical properties uh, of the whole atmosphere. <clears throat> And uh, uh, so uh, the whole atmosphere is rather deep. It's about 10% of the Earth's radius, uh, covering about uh, 29 scale height and uh, 13 order magnitude change in uh, density. And so the model should be robust enough to handle this uh, large scale uh, span. And uh, then the, uh, in the, uh, above the homopause, of course, uh, there's a diffusive separation, which is uh, uh, not present in the lower atmosphere. And uh, we need to consider ion neutral coupling because the, new, uh, the ions are organized differently uh, with the neutrals. It, they are o more organized more along the magnetic field line, so that needs to be uh, taken into account consideration. And uh, also, uh, we need, it's very important to consider the coupling between uh, dynamics and photochemistry. Uh, and uh, in the upper atmosphere, compared with the lower atmosphere, uh, in general, the temporal scales and spatial scales can be very short. And uh, because of these uh, different factors, for example, the increasing significance of uh, gravity waves and tides. Of course, tides uh, has large spatial scale, but the temporal scale is uh, quite short. And uh, very large wind, uh, storm time can be even larger. 
and uh, a very large acoustic uh, speed because of the increasing temperature. And uh, uh, during ge geomagnetic storms, uh, it can generate uh, very fine ionosphere structures at high latitude. And uh, lower latitude, you have uh, ionosphere irregularity, also have very fine stru uh, spatial structures. And uh, the uh, molecular viscosity, heat conduction, and diffusion are all very large and grow exponentially with altitude. So that's a very fast process uh, uh, in, the, in the upper atmosphere. So, um, the, uh, so we take that into account when formulating uh, the model or formulating the uh, mathematical and also numerical schemes. And uh, so the first thing we look at, as I mentioned earlier, is uh, we need to take into consideration the diffusive separation above the homopause, and that means the uh, uh, variables like, uh, or quantities like uh, specific heats and mean molecular weight, which are uh, constant uh, in the lower atmosphere, now are variables, and that need to be taken into account when solving the momentum equation and uh, the uh, uh, thermal equation. And uh, potential temperature, which a lot of uh, global models or GCMs uh, use as their state variable, is a very useful quantity for the uh, lower atmosphere. And, uh, but uh, it's somewhat opposed uh, in the upper atmosphere. So that need to be taken care of. And uh, also the variable gravity uh, is important uh, because the uh, scale height depend on that. Also, the, uh, therefore, the vertical distribution of species is dependent on that. So these uh, consider considerations are not trivial. So this shows the uh, uh, comparison of uh, uh, solution, you know, the model solution uh, using the default die core and the modified die core. So in the default die core, uh, the momentum equation uh, in the model is solved on the, uh, 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 the surface uh, of the axner function or axner pressure, which is p to the kappa. Kappa here is the uh, gas constant uh, ratio of gas constant and specific heat on uh, constant pressure. The reason for using that is that it has certain very nice features in conserving potential temperature when, so, uh, when doing the numerical solution. Uh, but this is fine if kappa is a constant, but now in the thermosphere, uh, kappa is a variable. So if we use this, it will cause a, a quite large uh, deviation or a bias in solving the pressure gradient. And as a result, uh, we get this temperature. This is a zonal mean temperature as a function of latitude and height. And uh, this is thermosphere. Ignore this uh, label. This is uh, not a, re a very realistic height. Uh, just uh, look at the pressure uh, height. And you can see that in the middle thermosphere, uh, this is in January. In the middle thermosphere, uh, the, uh, the temperature is cold, uh, colder or cooler than the, uh, sorry, this is the summer side. It's colder than the winter side. And uh, in, in the uh, upper thermosphere, uh, the temperature gradient, uh, Mariano gradient, is, has a right sign, but it's very flat, and it's different from the uh, climatology. And uh, uh, so uh, we, what we did is uh, to replace the vertical coordinate using the log pressure. You can also use pressure. And uh, uh, then we get a much better uh, solution. So you get the right uh, temperature gradient and uh, in the middle and upper thermosphere. And also the uh, moment, uh, the uh, thermal equation is uh, also important uh, to consider this uh, uh, variable quantity in the kappa. So this is using the default die core again, solving the, uh, um, uh, the thermal equation. And, uh, and due to adjustment, because uh, there's uh, always a bias introduced because of the incompleteness in the, uh, solving the thermal equation. There's always adjustment at different levels, and uh, this adjustment uh, grow with altitude and uh, uh, produce uh, spurious gravity waves. And these gravity waves can grow to a very large amplitude, and uh, this one goes to uh, uh, more than 50, uh, 40, uh, 40 meter per second. And uh, that ultimately make the model unstable. Uh, so, uh, so we need to uh, introduce this correction term considering uh, this kappa uh, variability. And uh, when we do that, uh, we get a much better results. Uh, we don't get the spurious uh, gravity waves, and the vertical wind is uh, uh, much more reasonable. And uh, uh, other considerations, uh, the coupling I mentioned, uh, uh, it's important to, for the model to consider the coupling between dynamics and the chemistry. And uh, the, uh, um, so that would require uh, advection of a large amount of uh, chemical species. 
And that would require uh, you have a very efficient, uh, computationally efficient and also conservative uh, scheme to do the advection. And ion neutral coupling is important, which would require a free, frequent remapping uh, between the physics uh, grid and uh, the geomagnetic grid. Uh, so that's, uh, that requires a, a very efficient uh, remapping scheme. And uh, also, ideally, you will have a transport routine that can uh, take care of uh, both the neutral uh, species advection and also ion species, <coughs> so that it can take uh, uh, both the neutral wind and uh, uh, ion velocities. Uh, this we haven't been able to achieve yet, so uh, the uh, <coughs> advection of neutral species and ion species are still solved separately. So uh, further uh, requirement, uh, this is from the short time and spatial scales. Uh, the, uh, there's a large disparity between the time scales uh, between the upper atmosphere and the lower atmosphere. And uh, as a result, uh, when we run the model, we usually uh, require a quite short time step to resolve the things we want to look at. Uh, usually we run time GCM and WACAMAX uh, using a five minute physical time step. But uh, some uh, lower atmosphere uh, parameterizations like the deep convection, they, uh, they have a lower limit uh, on the time step. Uh, they, you, the time step have to be usually longer than 10 minutes. Or, and so uh, then in the code design, it, it, it would be required to uh, uh, have the capability of doing sub-cycling or super-cycling so that they can accommodate at different time scales. And of course, uh, if you want to look at uh, fine structures, the uh, mesh refinement capability is very desirable. We haven't been able to do that yet. Uh, and also when the time scale gets to down to uh, brand weissler period or shorter, uh, you will need uh, uh, non-hydrostatic dynamics and uh, still that's uh, uh, to be developed for WACAMAX. And uh, uh, also when you increase your horizontal resolution, the horizontal diffusion will become important and that need to be uh, considered. And of course, if you want to run high resolution, it's very critical to have a scalable uh, model. And that's why we are uh, looking into the new uh, DICOR structures. And uh, uh, then we implemented uh, 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 the uh, interactive ionosphere uh, dynamo. And uh, basically, we saw uh, this is the same uh, structure as in TIEGCM. We adapt uh, the solution of the uh, 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 electrostatic potential equation in, in this model. And from this uh, HELIS uh, tutorial, uh, CEDAR tutorial, it's very clear that the whole system is uh, very closely coupled between the neutral and uh, uh, ionosphere, the dynamo. The currents, uh, for example, the, uh, uh, the E and F region dynamo, they, uh, electri uh, they affect the electric field, which uh, redistribute the ions, and that can affect both the conductivity and also the wind through uh, ion drag, and both come back and affect the uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the dynamo again. So it's a closely coupled system, and that would require the coupling uh, of the physics module uh, into, the, into the model. So that, that's what we did. And uh, the, uh, uh, also we adapted the uh, O plus transport module uh, in, from uh, TIE GCM or time GCM uh, in WACAMAX. And we solved the T tendency equation now. Uh, so it's not an equilibrium solution, uh, but a time dependent solution. Though it's still a simplified uh, for, uh, for, uh, formulation, uh, we are only considering the vertical comp uh, the components of the electron heat conduction uh, along field lines. And so uh, with that, those implemented, here are where we stand right now. Uh, these are the uh, WACOMX uh, capabilities. Uh, I think I've mentioned most of this. And I want to say that for high latitude, uh, the input can be specified using an uh, empirical model. We have the option to do HELIS or Weimer. And also, uh, Gang Lu uh, uh, and colleagues have implemented the AMI uh, recently in, the, in WACAMAX. And also, this infrastructure is pretty straightforward to adapt to implement, uh, to uh, incorporate uh, input from a uh, uh, magnetosphere model. Uh, so, uh, so one-way coupling should be pretty straightforward with a magnetosphere model. And uh, uh, the uh, coupling of a plasma sphere model is done by colleagues at NRL. They coupled WACAMAX with the SAMI-3 model. And uh, for the lower atmosphere climatology or uh, meteorology, uh, that can be constrained using nudging method, uh, using reanalysis data, uh, MIRA is what we use right now. And uh, uh, the, uh, 
for more realistic case studies and also for research forecast. Uh, data simulation is very important. Uh, Nick Patatella has led the effort to develop uh, the whole atmosphere data simulation. Uh, uh, so now it's, uh, uh, it's not in this release, uh, uh, but uh, it, the capability is being developed. And uh, actually, Bill Schreiner showed uh, some uh, new results yesterday from the uh, simulation of uh, ionosphere. So uh, actually, last year, we thought the model is going to be launched pretty soon, which is the same thought as uh, uh, Tom email, uh, thinking the ICON will be launched pretty soon. So we had a workshop uh, uh, and uh, also a tutorial session. And uh, um, so, uh, but the model, for some reason, was not launched, uh, mainly because of there's some problem with the, uh, the ground, uh, the surface emission um, um, uh, files, uh, the new surface emission files. So there's some problem with the climate. So, uh, but it's finally uh, uh, released, launched uh, earlier this month. Uh, uh, June 8th, and, uh, and I think that most of the, the tutorial uh, material are still relevant, and I think we have updated uh, this part too. And I will mention this at the end of the talk uh, with some links. And then we're going to look at some model results. So this is, uh, first we look at the thermal structure. Of course, that's very important uh, for a whole atmosphere model. So this is a global average temperature uh, under solar max conditions and solar mean conditions. So the solid line is uh, neutral temperature, ion temperature, and here's the electron temperature. And, uh, and this is the, uh, as I kind of showed earlier, the zonal mean structure uh, under solar max and mean conditions. Uh, one thing that we want to point out is that compared with the previous version of uh, Wacom Max, which doesn't have the ion neutral coupling, uh, our temperature is about 200 K warmer and that's mainly due to the thermal electron heating, which is a key uh, heating term uh, in the upper atmosphere. So that's now considered. And then we look at the mass and the electron density. Uh, so this is the uh, CHAMP measurement of uh, uh, neutral density and electron density at 400 kilometers. And uh, the, one of the key features here is this uh, peak around both sides of the magnetic equator, the uh, so-called uh, EMA, the equatorial mass anomaly. And that feature is now resolved uh, in the model uh, quite nicely. And of course, the, for the ionosphere, you have the EIA structure, uh, equatorial ionization anomaly. And that's also uh, a result uh, in the model. And uh, if we look at the time variation of the neutral uh, density, so we take this from uh, Chen Solomon, 2012. And they showed under solar max and mean conditions how the um, uh, global averaged uh, density vary over a year. Uh, so they show uh, both uh, annual variation and the semi-annual variation. So you have this primary low uh, around, the January, uh, around the June, July, August time period, and uh, a secondary low or minimum uh, around January and December, and a similar structure for solar minimum. So this is from uh, WACMX, and uh, we look at the same altitude, uh, similar uh, um, solar conditions, and uh, we do reproduce this uh, annual variation with the low in around uh, June, solst uh, June solstice, uh, but we do not reproduce the secondary low uh, or the minimum uh, here in uh, January or uh, December. And uh, so that's something we'll sweep under the rug for now and we'll come back later. And uh, uh, so then we look at the ionosphere. So this is uh, from Jin Liu's uh, validation paper and uh, they compared the uh, WACMX HMF2 with COSMIC uh, results and TIE GCM results. Uh, in general, uh, this is uh, for 2008, June, and uh, uh, different uh, UT times. And in general, the uh, HMF2 uh, looks very good. The comparison uh, is very good, and uh, which indicate that uh, the uh, electrodynamics in the model is working OK. And they also look at the structure of the NMF2. Uh, the peak, F2 peak density. And uh, uh, so same time, and uh, they look at uh, the uh, model and cosmic. And the general latitude longitude structure uh, still looks reasonable. Uh, there are differences. Uh, but I think the largest difference is that the, uh, uh, sometimes you see this uh, peak, the EIA peak, is very small compared with uh, observations. And uh, actually, you see that more clear in the uh, in the local or uh, uh, local measurement or um, point measurement, um, 
ground-based measurement. So here is a, a low latitude and mid latitude. The red is a WACMAX, and you can see that uh, it is about 50% of the peak value. So it's uh, really underestimating the peak EIA values, uh, and also in general the, the values in the ionosphere. So that's another item we're going to sweep under the rug for now, and we'll come back to that later. And also uh, put the model in the stress test uh, by looking at the storms. This uh, is shown by Chuck Bardeen last year at the CEDAR uh, uh, science highlight talk. And uh, this is a simulation of the Halloween storm. Basically, you see this uh, enhancement of the EI structure, the poleward expansion, and also the entrainment of the plasma density to high latitude due to the change of a convection pattern, uh, and uh, uh, which is referred as a town, uh, the uh, uh, town of ionization structure. And all those features seems to be uh, captured by the model. And this one uses the HELIS uh, parameterization or HELIS uh, empirical model. And there are also uh, several other uh, research uh, being done uh, using Wacom research or um, uh, validation studies. So the model has been used, for example, to study the uh, Great American uh, Eclipse and the whole atmosphere response to the eclipse uh, and uh, the influence of the internal atmosphere variability on uh, atmosphere response to geomagnetic storms and uh, also the hydrogen change in the mesosphere uh, all the way to the thermosphere uh, and also the whole atmosphere simulation of uh, the climate change, so the space climate. And uh, uh, in the next few slides, I'm going to spend a little bit more time uh, using the model to look at the equatorial ionosphere uh, weather. And uh, this one is still a validation. Uh, so we look at the vertical drift, uh, both the vertical and the zonal drift uh, from WACMX and compare that with climatology. So the uh, black solid line here is the uh, seasonal average uh, for the uh, drift, uh, vertical and zonal drift for equinox, uh, June solstice, and uh, uh, January or December solstice. And uh, the gray lines are the daily values from the model. So you see a lot of day-to-day -day variability scattering. And uh, the dotted lines are the climatology from uh, Hikamarka uh, Observatory. Uh, so I would say that in general, the two are in general good agreement. And uh, one feature particular we look at is this uh, uh, pre-reversal enhancement. And, uh, the, uh, uh, and you can see that uh, they agree with the climatology uh, reasonably well. And also the seasonal variation uh, is captured by the model. And uh, this is an uh, important quantity, of course, uh, because it is uh, thought to be driving the, uh, uh, the equatorial plasma bubbles, the EPB. Uh, and this feature, this quantity has been uh, uh, measured in previous observations. For example, this one from CNOFs. Uh, from Huang and Harrison, they measured the maximum PRE uh, in the equatorial region under solar minimum conditions and solar uh, max conditions. And they see this uh, quite distinct structure, uh, longitude and uh, seasonal structure, uh, with a peak uh, at, uh, in the uh, Atlantic sector, American sector, and uh, going to the uh, equinox, you see the split uh, into multiple peaks. Uh, and then at uh, June, around June solstice, uh, you see a secondary or uh, smaller peak in the African sector and Pacific sector. And that feature is, in general, uh, reproduced quite well with, uh, uh, in, 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 the, in WACMAX and, uh, uh, and also for solar minimum condition, uh, the general agreement uh, looks reasonable. And uh, these uh, this are all monthly results. And then if we look at daily results, this is from a daily output uh, of the maximum PRE uh, uh, from the model. So you can see that uh, superposed on the seasonal structure, there are a lot of day-to-day uh, -day variability. And uh, it's important to uh, point out that in this simulation, the solar condition is kept a constant, and also the KP is uh, constant and low. Uh, so all the uh, variability, the day-to-day -day variability, are coming from the internal uh, model variability, uh, most likely from the meteorological forcing. And uh, for example, this is uh, you know in the in in the time in uh, in July, for example, uh, the climatological value uh, of vertical drift or the PRE uh, tells you that they should be low, but sometimes on daily the daily values can be very large. 
So this, of course, has important implications for the short-term, uh, near-term variability of the uh, driving of the bubbles. So we look at this, uh, try to analyze the cost of the variability. And uh, the seasonal structure and the seasonal variability uh, from the model analysis uh, seems to be mostly due to the average in wind and the conductivity, so the average in dynamo. But it's also modified by the summerside E region. Uh, on the other hand, if we look at the short-term day-to-day variability, it seems it has a lot to do with the E region, and especially the summerside E region. So what I'm plotting here is a correlation coefficient, which is the, cut, uh, the white uh, contour lines, the correlation coefficient between the PRE at that location and, the, um, uh, and this quantity, this product, a zonal wind uh, times Patterson, which I just call a proxy to the uh, uh, dynamo or just dynamo. Uh, so, so you can see that there's a large correlation in the summer side E region and mid-latitude, mid-magnetic latitude. And also, the, uh, the other quantity I plotted here is the standard deviation of this quantity, the dynamo quantity. So you can see in that region, the standard deviation of uh, uh, this quantity is also very large. So this correlation is really a very impactful and meaningful correlation. And indeed, if we look at the time series of the PRE for July uh, of that simulation, uh, we see that, for example, the, t at the time when we have a very large uh, upwelling, it corresponds very well with this, uh, uh, this perturbation of the uh, this U times Patterson. And it's, uh, this perturbation is mainly coming from the per perturbation of uh, the, uh, the zonal wind. So this corresponds quite well with the eastward anomaly of the zonal wind. And a few days later, this, uh, uh, there's a large drop in the PRE, the maximum PRE, and uh, it corresponds quite well with the westward anomaly of the, uh, uh, of the zonal wind. And uh, we take a little uh, closer look at the time series of the wind. So this is the wind hourly output. Uh, just to point out that there's indeed a very strong eastward an anomaly. The vertical line is the 19 local time, 19 hour local time. So uh, uh, eastward anomaly and a few days later a westward anomaly. And if you look at the whole latitude, this is a, at one location, uh, east, uh, east uh, Pacific uh, sector. And if you look at the whole latitude, uh, longitude, and, uh, uh, and then, then the time. Uh, you see that the, the uh, prevailing pattern here is a semi diurnal migrating tide. And this is the local time, 19 again. Uh, but superposed on that, there are a lot of variabilities. For example, in the time when you see this uh, uh, very large eastward uh, uh, anomaly, uh, it seems there's a very strong eastward propagation uh, of uh, tidal components. Actually, if you measure it, it's also a semi diurnal component. So actually, it seems that there's a very strong uh, eastward non-migrating semi-narrow tide, or tides there. And uh, this is confirmed from the uh, spectral uh, decomposition. And uh, not going into the de details, but just to show that uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the time series of several different tidal components. And we can see that uh, for semi-narrow tide, the phase is quite stable. Uh, it almost always hit the, hit the low, the westward, uh, anomaly at 19-hour uh, local time. But, uh, but its uh, amplitude can still vary quite significantly from day to day, uh, which is the red curve. And then if you look at the semi-diurnal component, uh, the, um, the non-migrating semi-diurnal component, uh, their amplitude can change quite significantly and also their phase. So the superposition of this causes this uh, very large day-to-day -day variability. And then if we take that day-to-day -day variability and use the empirical relation between the PRE and uh, the uh, bubble uh, occurrence rate, uh, from the model we can deduce uh, uh, the uh, EPB rate. And uh, this is uh, from the model uh, uh, simulation from 2000-2002. And we deduced the, uh, the rate as a function of uh, longitude and season. And actually that uh, result compares quite well with the uh, previous observations, from, for example, from the Rockset 1 and also from a DMSP. Um, uh, so this uh, agreement, I think, is uh, very encouraging uh, to me because I felt that uh, the model doesn't resolve any uh, bubbles. So, but already the large-scale dynamics and uh, uh, electrodynamics already contains a lot of information about the bubbles when you, you know, use that empirical relation to deduce the bubbles. 
so, so maybe the, 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 indeed, the large scale play a very important role in precondition the bubbles, and also maybe point or suggest the feasibility of a probabilistic forecast of the bubbles, something like a outlook or warning forecast, uh, analogous to a tornado forecast. Usually they don't do tornadoes in the operational model, but they do you know, uh, outlook forecast. Uh, of course, uh, resolving the bubbles would re really require a high resolution capability, which we intend to develop in the future. And, uh, uh, and uh, getting the large scale right is one of the main motivations for uh, data simulation. And um, so, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Wacom X now can do data simulation, not only simulating the uh, meteorological forcing, but also the uh, middle atmosphere forcing, uh, so the middle atmosphere from uh, the uh, Saber and MLS temperature. And uh, uh, with this, uh, uh, Nick, in the, Nick Patatala in the uh, recent paper, they show that uh, for the time period uh, of the 2009 stratosphere warming, uh, they can reproduce the large scale vertical drift uh, very nicely. So this is a day and local time. So they can, for example, the shift of the downward drift and upward drift and the timing of those uh, uh, drifts are predicted quite nicely. And also from the forecast experiment they did, uh, they found the, uh, this large scale features uh, can be forecast about 10 to 20 days uh, in advance. And now let's uh, look under the rugs. And uh, uh, so I, mo I mentioned the uh, mo uh, model biases uh, and, uh, and uh, maybe some uncertainties. And one is the, the uh, uh, neutral uh, density, uh, lack of uh, semi-annual variation. And uh, the other is a very low ionization level in the, uh, in the ionosphere. Uh, so we looked into the model and looked at various quantities. One thing we noticed that is that the uh, added diffusion uh, from the model, which is generated from the uh, uh, Linzen parameterization scheme, uh, is just keep growing with altitude. It reaches its peak at about 200 kilometers, which is a bit counterintuitive because we expect the model uh, the, the model should uh, uh, kind of t uh, uh, re resolve uh, or kind of parameterize the, wa the wave in such a way that they will decay above the turbo pulse. So obviously the model or the parameterization scheme is not doing its work. Uh, so what we did is uh, just uh, quite arbitrarily uh, 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 scale down the uh, added diffusion and also other tendencies from the, uh, from, from the parameterization scheme uh, above the lower thermosphere. And uh, so once we do that, uh, we start to recover the, uh, for the neutral uh, atmosphere, we start to recover the semi-annual uh, variation uh, as well as uh, producing the uh, annual variation. So it seems that the very large added diffusion, this is, I uh, forgot to mention, this is a global average added diffusion for e uh, equinox and solstice. So, uh, so it seems that the very large added diffusion was overriding the uh, effects of the large-scale circulation. So we're losing uh, this, uh, uh, this secondary minimum in January and December, which is likely, most likely due to the large-scale circulation, the spoon effects. And uh, uh, then uh, if we look at uh, the um, uh, ionization level, the red is with the uh, uh, previous, uh, uh, at the large added fusion, and then the uh, black is with the reduced added fusion. So with the reduction of the added diffusion, uh, the, um, the ionization level becomes more realistic. And, uh, and I think that's what happened there is uh, the excessive added diffusion was just pulling down too much atomic oxygen, uh, so leave the ionization level very low uh, in the ion uh, ionosphere. So uh, we take this uh, consideration and combine it with the previous knowledge about our uncertainty in the Parameterization, uh, parameterized forcing by gravity waves, uh, we realized that uh, you know gravity wave parameterization uh, as a subgrid scale process is really a big problem uh, in the model. So here is a few years ago, uh, Palatella et al. They did an intermodel comparison, comparing four different whole atmosphere models, and basically he determined the reason, even though low atmosphere is identical in these uh, four models, the thermosphere deviate significantly. And the main cause uh, he determined is because of the uh, differences or deviations of the uh, uh, 
uh, parameterized drag in all these uh, different models. Uh, so yeah, so just what I said, uh, the um, uh, in important missing physics uh, in the model uh, is a gravity wave, uh, uh, the parameterization, and uh, it's not well represented, not resolved. Uh, so in the future, we need to either resolve them better with high resolution or better parameterize them, or uh, kind of correct the problem using a whole atmosphere data simulation. Uh, so here's a summary of uh, what I just said. Uh, so Wacomax, uh, we have developed uh, some key capabilities uh, that can uh, uh, treat the thermosphere, ionosphere, and whole atmosphere system uh, reasonably well, and we validate the model results uh, against uh, climatology and uh, observations uh, for both quiet time and disturbed uh, conditions, and also for long-term uh, space climate change. And uh, we used the model to look at uh, one example I showed is the ionosphere space weather effect, uh, the PRE, and seems to uh, give some interesting results about the day-to-day -day variability. And uh, also the model bias seems to be obvious uh, with the gravity uh, wave parameterization, which kind of uh, give you a feeling of deja vu, uh, considering the, you know, the, my post hoc project was on this uh, uh, very subject. So I guess you never uh, get too far away from your post op project. <laughs> and uh, the, um, so this is the uh, uh, useful link uh, you can uh, check. So as I said, uh, uh, the uh, CSM2, Wacomax, part, uh, Wacomax is part of that, has been released. Uh, it's a community model, so you should download it, play with it, and try to crash it, and find ways to you know, put in stress test. And also, you, you can develop modules for it. And um, uh, so this is a link uh, with the information uh, on Wacomax. And, uh, um, and this is a, a link to the CESM website with uh, a lot of inf inf uh, useful information, especially this is where you download the model. <coughs> and I list a, uh, a, a, make a list of the things that we would like to do in the next couple of years. Uh, definitely we want to work with the community, uh, support the both the satellite mission and also ground-based measurements and uh, for the interpretation and simulation of the observations and also probably include them in uh, data simulation. And uh, this could be a very powerful tool uh, to integrate the uh, uh, different observations and uh, have, uh, give us a better understanding of the whole atmosphere system. And uh, uh, we like to develop the, the high resolution capability and uh, also the ionosphere uh, uh, simulation uh, using Wacom, uh, and uh, um, incre increase the helium as a major species. This is important for the middle upper uh, uh, thermosphere studies. And also, currently, we have F region transport. Uh, we like to develop the E region transport, and also the metal ion chemistry, which is important for uh, things like a sporadic E. And D region chemistry has already been implemented as, uh, under test right now. And, uh, uh, and in the long term, we'd like to develop this uh, whole geospace modeling uh, by coupling Wacom to a magnetosphere and also plasma, plasma sphere uh, models. <coughs> and of, of course, all this development uh, will depend uh, or really rely on the continuous support by the funding agencies. And uh, uh, we're very grateful for the support uh, in the previous years uh, by the CEDAR program, uh, LWS, and uh, ONR and uh, AFOSR. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Han Lee. Yeah, thank thank you. you for that presentation. And we have some time for questions. So there are microphones on each side. Um, feel free to jump in. Uh, Hanli, thank you very much for the impressive talk. Um, I'm wondering when you go to higher resolution uh, of the model, do you also need to consider new physical processes in the model too? Or just increase uh, the, uh, the resolution of the grid points? Um, thank you. I think, uh, yes. Uh, I, uh, yeah, I think the, uh, maybe the first step is just to increase the resolution so that we see what happens. I think the chemistry should be the same. So maybe there's no need to update the chemistry, at least for now. And uh, for physics, uh, yes. Uh, for example, the, uh, 
I don't know the uh, like the uh, the uh, um, for example the high latitude input from uh, either the Weimer or um, uh, Healers, the empirical models, or from a magnetosphere model. Uh, when we go to high resolution, uh, we start to resolve finer st uh, scales. Uh, I don't know if there's maybe there's a need to update those uh, parameterizations. Um, uh, so yeah, so that's uh, and also the other thing is uh, 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 I mentioned um, uh, mesh refinement. Uh, of course, that's a very desirable feature, and we like to work on that. Uh, but also there may there could be some phys physics challenges too, because uh, you are resolving a regional um, uh, you know, area where you may have say enhanced wave uh, mixing, while other regions doesn't. And then will that form a sink at you know at that uh, hole in that region, uh, or how do you balance you know the refined region with uh, with the uh, coarse resolution region. So all those uh, challenges need to be considered uh, when we, you know, once, once we develop the model. Yeah. Hi, Hanli. I have a question. Thank you very much uh, for a comprehensive lecture. Uh, I have a question about this mixing. Um, so you reduced KZZ mm -hmm. uh, quite significantly. And then you said that you, you chose some arbitrary, arbitrary values that might give favorable sort of response. Uh, so since mixing is very important, right, as you know, that impact ionosphere through composition, impact recombination rate, impact on an ionosphere. Um, so it, it is difficult because KZZ, and I understand that those are not really directly observable. You have to parameterize, you increase resolutions, and then balance of mixing probably coming from tides and resolved waves increase, so that's why you probably need, you could reduce, that's a question to you, why you, what, why you think it has to be reduced right now, so that's one question. The second comment relating to this general topic is that since ionosphere has, we, ha we have more data, right? And then I wonder if you think, you could imagine uh, thinking about ionospheric data uh, to sort of tune those KZZ because it has feedback to, through recombination rate. Right. And then, and then I, I mean, you, you mentioned the data simulation efforts that could be, I mean, it's a, it's a tool for forecasting and then all that, but also a tool for parameter calibration as well. So I, I wonder if you have thoughts on that. So there one question and then one comment. Thank you, thank you, that's a good question. So uh, yes, so the, uh, the first question uh, I said, uh, I, we did this quite arbitrarily, but not totally arbitrarily, because that's what we did in time GCM. Uh, and uh, the physical argument is basically uh, most of waves should decay above the tur turtle pulse. I mean, the, um, it's just a strong molecular diffusion. You kind of expect that. Of course, there are high-frequency waves survive that, but in general, uh, on average, it should decay. That's the kind of our physical argument behind that. But uh, uh, but I, again, it's an arbitrary way of doing it, and uh, it's better to c uh, come up with a more uh, consistent uh, parameterization uh, to treat that problem. And, uh, and uh, before that, uh, coming to your second uh, question or comment, uh, before that, we can use, actually, it's good that uh, ionosphere and thermosphere has, a, has such a sensitivity to the diffusive transport, because that means that you can uh, use the thermosphere and uh, ionosphere as a constraint for the dynamics uh, in the MLT region. And uh, just as for the momentum uh, 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 budget, you can use the wind, the observed wind in the MLT region to constrain that, uh, uh, to constrain the gravity wave forcing. Now you can use the uh, composition in the thermosphere and ionosphere to, to constrain the diffusive transport. And uh, yeah, data simulation and also maybe parameter optim uh, optimization techniques could be very useful here. Okay, I think we're uh, running short on time, um, but I would like to take this opportunity to uh, present Dr. Han Li Lu with the, uh, the certificate for the 2018 Cedar Prize Lecture Award. Thank you, thank you, John.